I was uh, really intrigued when Hannah spoke the last time. Uh, she just happened to mention in kind of giving the rundown of her faith journey that she's really passionate about ecofeminist theology. And at the time, I thought I meant, I knew what that meant. I thought I knew, well, if it's got eco, uh, it must have something to do with the environment and creation. And if it's feminist, well, who knows what that could be. <laughs> but I, I thought, gosh, I would really like to know really what that is and hear from someone who really does know what it is firsthand. And so she's agreed to uh, dive deeper into that for us and perhaps open our eyes to something that maybe we uh, can relate to ourselves or that may also help us on our paths to God um, by opening us up or potentially informing us that we might be able to help inform others as well. Um, so in actually preparing for this, I was uh, looking for something uh, to sing because Tracy had asked me to sing again. And <clears throat> I, um, of course, I have a head cold and all of that, but uh, I have stumbled on this song before Hannah and I talked and I was not familiar with it. It's in the, uh, the Chalice Hymnal and um, I'd never heard it before, but I was very intrigued and I thought, what a weird timing that this should fall in my lap. And then she's talking about what she's going to discuss. And uh oh, she's frozen. She sits hovering on the chaos of the world's first day. She sighs and sings, mother in creation, waiting to give birth to all the word will say. She wings over earth, resting where she wishes, lighting close at hand or soaring through the skies. She nests in the hole, welcoming each wonder, nourishing potential hidden to our eyes. She dances and fun, startling those who see her, Waking tons of ecstasy where dawn is weak. She wins and inspires all whose hearts are open. Nor can she be captured, silenced, or restrained. For she is the spirit, one with God in essence, gifted by the Savior in eternal love. She is the key, opening the scriptures, enemy of apathy and heavenly dawn. And I neglected to mention that in Hebrew, the word used for spirit is ruach, and it is a feminine noun. Mm -hmm. Great. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Just feel free to flag me down if, uh, if you lose me. Um, one thing that really stands out to me, actually several things stand out to me in that song. And I'm, I'm thinking about that and how the words come together and the images that we're left with in that song. And if you think about that song in comparison to uh, the doxology, and the, the doxology and this song are in the same hymnal, the chalice hymnal. Um, and I'll just, I'll just sing a little bit of the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Okay, I sang the whole doxology. But um, there, do you notice, do you notice a very different set of images between the first song that we heard from Michelle and the doxology? Yeah, the girlfriend. We've got, we got messages coming to us um, through metaphor, through embodiment, through the language of dancing. It's a very physical activity. 
Um, and so that's one of the things that comes to mind that really stands out as what ecofeminism and feminism, particularly for this example, what it brings to the table and the different set of values that it brings to the table. So ecofeminism, ecofeminism really would embrace these other images that don't just restrict God and the image of God and the symbol of God to he, to him to the hierarchy that we saw in the below, the language of below and above. Um, and so I thought that that was a really great, that was a really great song for us because a lot of the music that we sing in our liturgies really still use a particular set of images to represent God. But uh, we all come to God and come to understand God in a lot of different ways. And so ecofeminism really embraces that. So I recognize, I recognize that eco kind of sounds like a set, a certain set of values. And I realize that feminism also kind of has a lot of attached, a lot of attachments to it. And um, I, I don't know, do, do any of you have a particular understanding or what comes to mind when I say feminism? Girl power. Okay. <laughs> Good. Strength by the feminine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. standing up for your rights mm -hmm, mm -hmm. political yeah mm -hmm. and gender centric ideology mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh yes these are all these are all i would i would agree with those i'm not an expert on feminism but you know there are people who hear feminism hear the word fem feminism and they think of a militant feminism that hopes to sort of diminish the um, the presence and, and power of of male um, of male activities or, or of men in general uh, that that is not how the academics are speaking of feminism and so I think that's an important thing to correct and to sort of intervene do a little intervention if a friend is is uh, is nervous about feminism really feminism is just about um, sh like sharing the playing field with, with all the genders that are represented. And so um, this is not, let's lift, up, let's lift up women way higher than men. It's men have had the microphone for a long time. What, if we, what happens if we share the mic? And that's the question. What happens if we share the mic? And ecofeminism is, is, uh, is interested in that question. And so when it comes to eco, ecological, you could hear, you might hear ecofeminism or you might hear ecological feminism, but um, ecofeminism, I love it because it really embraces the interconnectedness of all creatures, of all created things in the universe. And to me, that is a very, very powerful way of understanding God. And it happens to match how I logically logically, not just emotionally or physically, but how I logically come to um, understand who and what and how and when God is. So the three things I've listed, I've, I have a little set of notes here. The three things that really make ecofeminism my jam are these. Um, it places value on shared prosperity among all creatures and all created things um, rather than individual prosperity. And so for me, that you can see some of the connections of um, where prosperity is, is aligned in some of our social, social and economic systems. Um, and we can come back, I can say more about that later if you'd like, but I'll move on. Number two, ecofeminism embraces a radical, I already said this, radical interconnectedness of all creatures. It reminds me, like to the extent that it reminds me of the butterfly effect where one simple movement or one simple action causes a rippling, a rippling, a rippling. And so something, it affects, eventually it affects something on the other side of the planet. Okay, number three. Uh, my own spiritual journey is deeply fed and stirred uh, by the logic of ecofeminism. So those are the three things that really have drawn, that have really kind of make ecofeminism my jam. Um, um, in a more concise and defined few sentences, ecofeminism examines interconnections between the domination of women and the domination of nature. So the assumption is that someone doing or understanding ecofeminism 
recognizes that women have been dominated, like that women have been treated as objective rather than subjective in society and culture for generations. So you might think back to when, um, when women were really truly treated as property. Um, and so that, and then there is obviously an outcome from that. And um, you might also think of how nature is really treated as, as, a, as a resource for humans to use as they please. Um, and so this domination, oh, is so long as I can dominate it, I should. That's, that's a logic that does not resonate with ecofeminism. And so, uh, you, you know, there might be a conversation about whether, you know, using resources or, um, well, using certain resources on the planet is actually good and useful and nourishing and helpful. So that, that's not to say that we have to leave the earth alone entirely. Uh, but that is to say that we recognize a connection that domination and having power over is, um, it, it is rejected. Okay. So I hope, I hope that I have just at least the, the very tip of the iceberg. Is there anybody that's already totally lost? Because sometimes I stutter through things. Okay. Okay. I really like the concept of celebrating the feminine mm. versus feminism, which comes with a lot of baggage. It does. Yes. The baggage is the right word. <laughs> it is. Okay. Okay, so I like to think of ecofeminism as a commitment to speaking about God in ways that advance the full humanity of women and men and all creation. Um, and that's why I really love the song that Michelle sang. I think that we are, uh, we are so dependent on metaphor and imagery as well as logic and as well as, as the education in our systems to make, to make sense of the world around us. And I think God participates in those, in those things um, in a very active way, in, in a not passive way at all. <laughs> so ecofeminism draws attention to the connections. And that, that's a really important part. Uh, it, it doesn't just take for granted the connections. It really, the, a part of the spirituality of ecofeminist theology is drawing attention to those connections and actually living into those connections on a daily basis. So, for instance, um, I believe that this is a very powerful symbol of spirituality. So for me, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of imagery in the light, in the the resources of using the light, in um, you know building putting something together for my use, and I am participating with the elements in this symbol to make a part of my spirituality more prevalent right now. And so this candle for me, I've I've become a little bit more aware and saddened by the plight of the Uyghur Muslims in China, and I can say more about that later, but. To me, lighting a candle, knowing that that's what's on my mind and that's what, that's what I'm lighting this candle for, to me is a way of living into an eco-feminist spirituality because it really draws attention to the connections that I have to this and what this symbol means to me and how, uh, oh gosh, I'm sorry. I got two dogs down here that are being relatively quiet. Um, so anyway, uh, really, really um, celebrating and embracing the small, tiny micro connections that we have to the things around us and letting that represent the larger connections that we have to other, to other maybe bigger systemic things. Okay, so I mean, that's it's also not just unique to a lot of this. There's gonna be a lot of overlap. Okay, is the point. Um, let's see, in ecofeminism, feminist consciousness is extended beyond specific societal wrongs that diminish women uh, to the recognition that there is no liberation for women and no solution to the ecological crisis within a society whose fundamental, whose fundamental model of relationship making and relationship existing. Um, uh, spot, spot, spot. Oh, can exist in domination. So if uh, so relationships that are built around the prevalence or the preference, I mean, for one type of person, and in this case, it, it might be men, it might be a group of people, it might be the 1% or it might be the 99, whatever it is, if there is anything that really is to benefit one group or one person over the others, um, 
feminist uh, ecofeminism has a problem with that. Okay. Are you hearing all of the dings that are coming into my computer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought it was like a Zen I thought, this, <laughs> I thought it was some coming from China. I've got my family texting me right now, and they don't know that this is not a good time. <laughs> What's more distracting Katie, could you is text the guy everyone and tell keep them walking around the back. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Look, okay, we're doing our best over here. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, I'm going to move ahead here. Um, Ecofeminism unapologetically embraces our interconnectedness to one another to our social and educational and economic systems and to the natural world. Um, and I don't know about you, but I think ecofeminism has struck me really hard because I have just become more and more aware of the ecological crisis. The more that I learn about the waste um, that we are producing that's doing real harm to other creatures that were created by God, um, the more I feel connected to that harm and it hurts. It really does hurt. Um, and so that's part of, I think that is part of the eco-feminist construct is really feeling the weight of what effect we are having on the natural environment. Eco-feminists point out that depicting nature as external to humans is, uh, is one of, is, it is a piece of the, okay, it's, it's a bad use of the gender metaphors. So we, we can't, we really can't think of ourselves as separate from nature. And a lot of, I think a lot of, a lot of theology depicts us as separate and a lot of it doesn't, but it is interesting once you start reading interpretations, or maybe you're going to read some theologians, um, if you start to see the dynamic of nature and then there's humans, um, that like that would be a rejection from from eco eco feminism, um, and like this will start getting a little bit more smooth in just a minute. <laughs> okay, uh, eco feminism also in, affirms the intrinsic worth of every facet of creation. So there's already an existing intrinsic, just beautiful worth of value in every in every aspect of creation and so ecofeminism seeks out that worth it seeks out um ways that that our connections to the natural world and the natural processes like flames like heat like cold um these all of these things do work together to show us a god of love a god of acceptance a god um of all sorts of images right so uh Let's see. Okay, one of my okay, two of my favorite ecofeminists are Sally McFaig. She wrote a lot in the '90s, and Elizabeth Johnson. She's also a big writer in the '90s. Um, and I, I think I mentioned Elizabeth Johnson the last time I was on because I was reading a book from her. But um, uh, I love what what Elizabeth Johnson says. She says. Um, she recognizes that no human could like possibly comprehend all there is to comprehend about God. Um, and that's a good thing. Uh, but she also says that how we imagine God to be informs the kind of Christians we are. And I'm going to say that again. She says that how we imagine God to be informs the kind of Christians we are. And accordingly, the kind of world we create. Okay, so if we are the kind of Christians that maybe prefer hierarchy or m are, really, are really proud of masculine language or, um, you know, don't, don't celebrate the, the small micro connections we have to all creation, well, then we end up creating a world that prioritizes those same things. And so I, I like the way she said that because it does seem to be, it does seem to be true. And I bet if I put out like a poll or like a survey, hey, what kind of ways do you see um, the way we talk about God in the way our structure, our systems are structured? And I, I see like the doxology when we have, when we have such a prevalence or a, a beautiful lexicon for hierarchy and power, well, then hierarchy and power kind of becomes our mode of understanding and our way of engaging with the world around us. Um, 
And so if, if we are to really embrace an interconnectedness of all of these concepts and of all of these images, well, then we have to really understand or embrace that, uh, that the way that we understand God to operate also informs the way we create the world around, the, we, we respond and co-create with the world around us. Have I lost anyone? Not yet. No. Okay. Okay, good. I have, um, I have a quote from Elizabeth Johnson that is, I just think, wonderful. And she says this. <sighs> I want to make sure I set it up right. Um, she and five people. Oh, okay. Uh, ecofeminism. This is not the quote. Ecofeminism. Um, envisions humanity at its best when it authentically participates in the design of the natural world and doing so becomes our strategy for practicing our spirituality. Oh, I just love that. I just love that. I don't, it's like, there's no, there's no escaping one. They're all connected. Um, I just love it. We're at our best when we are authentically participating in the design of the natural world. Okay. So here's her quote. A flourishing humanity on a thriving planet, rich in species in an evolving universe, all together filled with the glory of God. Such is the vision that must guide us at this critical time of Earth's distress to practical and critical effect. Ignoring this view keeps people of faith and their churches locked into irrelevance, while a terrible drama of life and death is being played out in the real world by contrast in the real world by contrast living the ecological vocation in the power of the spirit sets us off on a great adventure of mind and heart expanding the repertoire of our love Oof. expanding the repertoire of our love i'm a singer and so one of the one of the things that we had to work on often in um you know, as we studied, as I studied this was building your repertoire, building your repertoire meant you could address and you, you were available for certain auditions. You were suddenly a little bit more valuable to a company if you had a really expansive repertoire. Well, my goodness, if we thought about a repertoire of love, of ways that we are engaging with the world and responding to crises and, and being a still small voice and responding to a still small voice or, 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 or standing out in protest. Um, if, if, if we think of acts of love as building a repertoire of God's love, mm, I just think that that is a really powerful tool that really can inform a really robust spirituality. So a, a natural question from all of this is, so, like, is there any biblical grounding for this? And the answer is yes. Um, we, a lot of eco, no, most ecofeminism looks directly at the, um, the garden as a place of I idealness and a thing that we have gotten away from. And so that our true, our true self as a whole, as in planets and creatures and created things, um, it is a place that is perfect. And so we get, we've gotten away gotten away from a beautiful garden okay got a, got a dog barking here <laughs> almost there um but i like i like the use of scripture and using scripture to speak to my ecofeminism or ecofeminism in general um and i just wanted to direct your attention to matthew 13 this uh, he uh, jesus gets out onto a lake and he does this to speak to he gets out on a lake and then he speaks to a crowd. Um, and if you didn't know, sound bounces off of water a lot easier than it does off of land. And so when we see Jesus in the lake, we see him participating with nature for the benefit of God's people. Um, uh, he, okay, so Matthew 13 is where Jesus asks, is asked, like, why are you talking to all these people in metaphor? I mean, parable. <laughs> and he responds by saying, this is, essentially, this is the best way for them to hear this message. This is the best way for them to hear this. Um, and that is how I, that is how I understand ecofeminist theology for now. And this might grow and I might change, but, um, <coughs> sorry. Um, but I just hear, I, I hear and feel and understand God through the images of nature. And that might not be for everyone. And I hear and seeing God, uh, in the, in the natural process of, of phonation, of singing and of sleeping and of warmth and of and of togetherness so uh 
So there's that. We have the parable of the weeds. That's, that's the first lesson in, uh, in this section. And then we have the parable of the mustard seed. Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of God's presence in natural objects. And this is a beautiful way of understanding God and coming to God. Um, and also, the very last one on my list here is the parable of the leaven. And I just love, and I'm just like, think of this in slow motion, okay? You're, the camera is zooming in to a woman, and her hands are a little aged, and she's kneading bread. She's working the leaven into the dough, and she's kneading the dough, and it's going to hands are participating with uh, the life that is in that piece of dough. It is participating there and she's folding it in and she's working it out and it's going to become something fuller and something more and it's going to be good. And then bread is a whole Christian symbol on its own. And I just love that image that the woman with her hands in creation, participating with creation, um, and this is what God, this is what Jesus likened the, the realm of God to. Um, you might also notice that ecofeminists uh, would rather say realm of God than kingdom of God simply because of the connotations of kings and knights and domination. But we get it. <laughs> it's a beautiful word. Okay. So, um, so like this is, a, this is a beautiful piece. This is a beautiful image that we get that I think really, like, really captures ecofeminism. Um, and, and, that, and I think I wanted to leave it at that in case there was other ways that we can have this conversation, maybe through some questions or expanding on some of the things that I've touched on. Um, but the, the last piece, of course, for me, <laughs> um, is we, we should direct our attention to where there is harm on the planet. There is harm to humans and not that the harm to humans makes it any worse or any better. But you can usually see those connections. And, and, the, one, and the one that stands out today, uh, I'm thinking of, the, of Cancer Alley, the, um, the area along the Mississippi River where a lot of, of industry and plants are, and we end up with a lot of chemicals in that area. And we see a high rate of cancer just in that area where they're getting their water from. Um, and so this is, this, is the kind of, this is the kind of mindset and the kind of uh, attention given to the, the, co the connection and the, connect the interconnectedness between natural processes, humans' participation with natural processes, and the outcome of, the, of that decision. So, so in a nutshell, we are incredibly interconnected. Our micro decisions and our micro behavior is important to the realm of God. It is important to God. And, we can, and if we look, we can see images of God in all good things. I have a question. Yeah. I like the story that you told about the candle. Oh, yeah. Can you give us another example um, of something when you feel connected to God mm -hmm. in a small way, yeah. but it's a big way, really. Yeah, yeah. So um, you might be familiar with the uh, practice of Taize, a Taize service, or or maybe, okay, it's, you, you might also think of Lectio Divina, divine reading. Okay, so Taize, Taize music is very repetitive. It's very repetitive. You might sing one phrase, Dona nobis pacem, um, give, give us peace, um, like 13, 20 different times. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know the song, Dona nobis. Well, the idea is that this is just repeated and repeated and repeated, and like you're in a setting of candles and quiet and peace. Well, what you know, what we learn from repetition is deeper understanding and kind of giving the space to ponder a little bit more. And so this is an act. It's not just thinking, don't anobis pachem, don't anobis pachem. It's participating in your own natural systems of singing and phonating and letting that resonate and letting the repetition take over as a natural process. And that becomes a mode of spirituality because we are doing a lot of inner reflecting um, and, you know, deci deciphering the, the connections that we're making in that moment. Um, I did also, I mentioned, I mentioned my favorite 
my favorite nun. Last time I'm doing it again. Hildegard of Bingen. She's my favorite. Um, <laughs> and she was uh, she, from the Middle Ages. And she, she did a lot with this kind of work, which is repetitive. And, and she would use a lot of the natural processes just in singing that to inspire God's presence or awareness of God's presence. Um, and so that, I would say that's another example of feeling really connected to the nap, to what is happening naturally. And, and if you ever take any voice lessons, that's a lot of, well, a lot of what singing does is how to do it really well is to connect to what's really naturally happening and supposed to happen. Um, for the benefit of the sound. <laughs> Thank you. Sure, sure. And I, I'm sure that we could all come up with one. Well, in the spirit of all God's creatures, I found that the dog's barking was like saying, oh man. And I'm oh, <laughs> that is so <laughs> profound. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. You know, the Georgian uh, monastery chants are like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the island of Bali, um, the spiritual uh, folk all sit under a tree and do a monkey chant, which is repetitive literally all day. This mm. thing. You know, and the Buddhists have the same thing, you know. Um, yes. And, uh, um, you know, the, the Buddhist temples uh, in India or Nepal and Bhutan, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> repetitive chanting and walking around, ringing the bells and mm. You know, um, as a same, you know, different experiential Oof. aspect of it. I love that. And that experiential aspect, yeah. it's hard. It's sometimes it's really hard to connect the dots between a theology, which, you know, right. theo logos, that's all about word. So it's, it's really hard sometimes to connect those dots. But feminine, eco feminist theology really does say, like, if it, the, like embrace the dance, embrace the song. You know, embrace the, 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 the quiet. That, that is a direct word. That is a word from God. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's beautiful. I think um, that it finally, finally clicked for me there toward the end. Because mm -hmm. um, in the beginning, I kept finding myself saying, well, isn't all Christian theology that way? Isn't that all our goal? And, but then to the experiential part of that seemed to kind of connect more for me. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it should be noted that a lot of our rituals are also built on some of the hierarchical thinking or, or patriarchal thinking. Um, and I say that just because a lot of the rituals started in, in priesthoods and those were men. But um, so like, I'm thinking of, if you, to come up to an altar or the way that we sit in a sanctuary, there is a one and then there is an other. Um, so that, so that is a, a bit of a separation and delineation of, of purpose and power in that space. Um, now, whether we really know, like, like see it that way or feel that way, you know, who, who knows how the, how the next person next to you is, is seeing this space, but the way that we have designed our rituals also is informed by a certain way of thinking. And I see a lot of, you see a lot of, we saw a lot of uh, eco-feminists changing, changing pronouns in the seventies uh, of, of really, of really strong, really strong hymns. Um, and you, we saw a dip, like different shapes of sanctuaries emerging too. Like, Oh, maybe it doesn't have to be this, this uh, rectangle with this seating, but maybe it could be more of a, of a theater in the round type of thing. Um, and many more theologies that were using the image of the circle and doing uh, uh, of creation. Uh, oof, that's not coming out right. But the image of the circle being a, a, an important one in the late 70s. You know, Hannah, when, uh, when you were talking about eco-feminism, mm -hmm. a lot of things reminded me of Eastern religions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Hinduism and Buddhism and Jainism. Mm -hmm. The reverence and respect for nature mm -hmm. and of, of all living things, you know, and um, uh, so I'm reminded that the crisis in the West begins with the Christian doctrine, um, the, the story of creation, uh, 
seven days God creates nature, the last day he creates human being, a male, and says that I create you so that you can dominate the world that I created. Mm -hmm. And out of you, out of your appendage, I will create a woman. So in other words, she is always secondary to you because she is just a small part of you, mm. the rib, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it makes her out of uh, a part of the, uh, the man's anatomy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There itself lies the, the, the die has been cast of our imagination. Yeah. How do we now the Western civilization has to extract itself out of it? What did God really mean by his story of creation? Yeah. We put meaning into it and, and made it into, okay, so God made, you know, uh, a man to rule the world and reap the harvest, kill everything to eat, um, unhindered. And, uh, and there comes the, the, the story of the Western civilization. Yeah. And we imagine Adam to be a white man, and um, uh, Some, yeah. because, because the entire narrative of the West of Christian ideology is, you know, take Michelangelo's paintings to uh, to our entire theologian stories. Are uh, it's a white man who is created to rule the world. Mm -hmm. So when you said that, until we do not dominate each other see the word right. dominance yeah right i think that's that's what the entire civilization of the west uh is is based on yes yes so now how i'm we retell the story you know uh, that, uh, amen uh, is your do you say your name ananta uh-huh okay thank you for that uh not that i think that was really that's a really point like a really pointed point i love that because who you know who decided that the interpretation of that scripture is the word dominate, right? You know, so yeah. th there are, there are many different ways to read that. And that was not English. We didn't, it wasn't were first written. It was first, it was handed down through oral tradition and then <laughs> written that? down in yeah. Hebrew and <laughs> then written down in English. So uh, yeah. we are many, many, many interpretations away from the original and, um, that's not to say the Greek and Latin. Yeah, yeah, the Greek, the Greek is New yeah, Testament. <laughs> yeah, the Greek is the New Testament. But, um, but yeah, good point. And then, um, you know, a lot of ecofeminists might say, well, it turns out Adam needed a, needed to humble himself to lessen himself. And right, that's a, that's even that's from a psalm too. Like, may I decrease so that you may increase, Lord. But decreasing in humility is part of the story for the ecofeminist. Um, so that, I, I, yeah, I probably should have started with, that's a good, that's, that's like the problem. And so, um, you, you think about that, but also how many of you have, you have read, how many of you have read the gospel of Mary Magdalene? Mm -hmm. Oh, have you? I haven't read it yet. Okay. I'm impressed. Okay. Um, because I don't know your name and I can't tell your name from your, uh, who are you from? Uh, Lane. The way Lane. Oh, you like. You like. Okay, so you have. Um, but, you know, who was at the council to say what belonged in the canonical gospels, in the canonical scripture? White men. Not a single woman. Yeah, white men, nonetheless. <laughs> so, and it's an important, it's important to realize who is shaping the narrative and that the, the people or the persons shaping the narrative of Western society and culture really don't have the full image of God packed into them or, or into their awareness. And that's, I think that's a good thing, but not, n not in the, not in the structure of, of dominance and hierarchy. And so no, that's just, yeah. Thing in, the, in those readings that really ought to be in the Bible. Yeah. Oh, I, I yeah. recommend people read them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How, about, written? how about in the book of Acts? I, I believe it's in the book of Acts where, uh, the uh, apostles are looking for a replacement for Judas Iscariot and they need to vote on these two people mm. <clears throat> because 
before Pentecost, they want to be representative of the 12 tribes. Mm. And there are only 11 of them. Mm. And uh, Peter makes it known that it's the election is for men only. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I thought that was rather strange. And it makes me think that that produces some kind of connection to uh, Mary Magdalene Christianity. Mm. You know, I went to a lecture. I started to go to Bright Divinity School, and I went to a lecture for Bright, and it was about Magdalene Christianity, mm. which I found profoundly interesting. Mm. And I relate that back to that part in the book of Acts where it's Peter that stood up and said, you know, basically that this election does not include women. And it makes me think, why did he say that? Was he afraid of Mary Magdalene because of, you know, her position with Christ? Mm. And it makes me think, this might be a ridiculous thought. It makes me think even to the extent that maybe she could have been the original Pope. Mm. Now, wouldn't <laughs> that know, be something? The, the St. Peter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, St. Peter stopped or narrowed the election into a gender specific, which always has been kind of intriguing to me. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I, I like to give a lot of credit to the context of the time and the place that scripture was written. And yeah, while it, I do too. Yeah, and while An it anthropology type. Yeah, and so while it can be frustrating that, you know, Jesus doesn't speak, speak specifically about, about uh, mm. you know, women serving in, in, in specific positions throughout the church and throughout the rest of history, um, and he doesn't speak about gay marriage, um, and he doesn't speak about abortion. Unfortunately, we don't have, we don't have, like, the specific quote from Jesus, um, but I do give credit to the time that Jesus was speaking and then to the eventual time that it was written down. And so um, I, I, I do recognize that that was a culture and society missing out on a lot of beautiful voices. And I, and, and I, that's, that's too bad, but, but now yeah. we have, but now, you know, women have been elevated. And so what does that mean? What does that mean for scripture if for us to recognize the elevation of women and all creatures? <laughs> Well, I have two comments about what you just said about Jesus spoke and then later on people wrote it down. Mm -hmm. Of course, the people who wrote it down had a, a bias, as we all do. Mm -hmm. I was reading right. a story about Paul when he was wandering, when he was traveling the Roman Empire, trying to establish Christian churches and figure out what Christianity was. Mm -hmm. So you have Jesus saying that all people are equal under God, meaning men, women, slaves, even the highest Roman citizen at the time, which was at the top of the heap and the slave were equal under God. But particularly, he said, everyone, including men and women, and Paul was struggling with this. What you see oftentimes in the writing is the end result, not the struggle they were going through. And he couldn't get past his Jewishness and his Greekness mm. to see that women were not property, they were equal to men. It was the nature of the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when he writes down his thoughts and so forth, it comes with that background that he has of being Jewish and Greek and the role of women relative to men. Mm -hmm. He could not overcome that to what Jesus said is all people equal under God. Mm -hmm. And then a few hundred that. years later, a couple hundred years later, you have the issue, I, I forget exactly what the quote is, but it's, it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to go to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> the rich people were kind of stuck with this because Christianity was becoming really popular as the Roman Empire was declining. Christianity was kind of taking over the leadership role in a lot of places, and the rich people were kind of feeling left out here because <laughs> everybody was supposed to be equal. Yeah. So they managed to say, well, if, if it, all the rich people gave everything they had to the poor, there wouldn't be any rich people left to support the poor. And <laughs> the bishops at the highest level felt they had to live a high lifestyle so they could rub elbows with the rich people to get more people to the poor. They were having all these justifications for <laughs> enjoying the wealth of the world. And it just so happens that the wealthier people tended to be the ones that were, had the means to write things down 
and yeah. to uh, hmm. tell the story yeah. that lasted. Yeah. So again, the a group of people dominated the others based on the nature that they had. Right. So we have the New Testament, anyway, uh, stuff being uh, uh, recorded by people with a a bias, and that's what we see today. So let's yeah. just move, let's just recognize that and. Mm -hmm. And the winners tell the, story, tell the story differently. The winners always write the history. <laughs> there was, there was. Uh, I've, I've told this story before. Uh, there were some friends that were going on, but for years they thought I was Jewish. Go figure. Uh, but uh, one came up to a up to a party, feeling very um, spiritual or religious, I guess. And said, well, you know the the Jews are the chosen people. And my response without batting eyes, that's because they wrote the book. <laughs> Let's not lose track of that fact. Yeah. There, there, there's a lot that's been lost. Um, because again, you know, the winner gets to make the facts. So it's just, you know, it's there, just there's also a strong emphasis, and we're getting a little off here, but there's also a strong emphasis for the Jewish tradition for internal coherence. And so for a prophet to prophesy and to not, for that not to be fulfilled sort of just starts to discredit um, some, of the, some of the writings. And so the, you, you saw a lot, and I love the interpretation of, um, of the Old Testament in the, pra in the tradition of the, oh, the, oh I'm lo I've, lost the, I've lost the word because it's in a different language, but um, where rabbis have taken to the scriptures to interpret for the times. And so there's this kind of like treeing, rooting, growing effect of interpretation of these scriptures. Um, but internal coherence is so important because eventually you end up with a document uh, and it's in front of you. And it's no longer just an oral history. I have to plug in my computer. Hang on. <laughs> oh, that was just me. <laughs> now, um... All right, Dorothy, you've been kind of quiet. Oh, too much. Okay, to did hear. I miss anything? Not miss something if I talk. <laughs> <laughs> that was a profound statement. I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling a lot of envy. A lot of what? Feeling a lot of envy. Envy. Oh, um, you have. Uh, uh, you're not a woman. <laughs> what, what? Dad? What, Roy? Feeling a lot of envy. Envy. Oh. I haven't been that. <laughs> I can't hear anything. I don't know what's going on. About anything. For so long, I uh, I'm just kind of in awe <laughs> um, at her, at your intensity. At Hannah's intensity. It's been a long time. It's refreshing, isn't it? Yes, it really and is. The, the first time, yeah. the first time she joined in my phone. In, in, oh, are you hearing it now, Hannah? Are you connected again? Oops, oh, I got a reconnector. Hang on, guys. She had to hang up and get back on. She's missing all these compliments. <laughs> okay, there she comes. Yeah. <laughs> we have two Hannahs. Oh, it's going to have to be dramatic, I guess. <laughs> Sorry. I, I think the dogs had their work. <laughs> we want us to rewind. So, uh, oh. <laughs> you have a you have a challenge uh, uh, on your hands because uh, on the screen you're actually seeing a name uh, called Sarmila Bagale mm -hmm. and she is tuning in from Kathmandu, Nepal. Oh wow! And um, so uh, she is not uh, familiar with Christianity. Mm -hmm. nor, um, uh, I I don't know whether her. Uh, Samila, I forgot to ask you, do you, do you have, are you a Buddhist or do you have a religion? Hello? Uh -huh. Samila? Yes, yes, please, oh, yeah. There she is. Why did you see her? Yay! <laughs> 
So, uh, good evening, good morning, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, Hannah, uh, so when I was listening to Hannah, I'm going, okay, I wonder what Sarmila thinks about this. Mm. So, you know, the eco feminism and how, uh, you know, or the oneness with nature. Uh, how, how do people in Nepal look at environmental crisis and how how do women react to this uh, based on their value system or uh, religious mm -hmm. principles? Do you, uh, do you uh, have any thoughts on it or is it too complex? <laughs> right yeah, now? yeah. Uh, almost uh, women believe to religions. Uh, a, a tentative uh, 80, 81% uh, uh, follow the uh, Hindu religions. Uh, but uh, multi, yeah, uh, Nepal is multi ethnic, multi religious country. Maybe every, every, everybody knows that. I know. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, in, in Nepal, um, almost, uh, yeah. I know that uh, uh, eco-feminist uh, means just uh, already you have mentioned that uh, nature, uh, like natural world and human is gradually a reality relationship, right? But uh, in Nepal, <coughs> almost women uh, like it uh, according to uh, uh, 2011 uh, census data, 22% women aged like uh, 50 to 49 have experienced physical violence. How to address about this matter? Like 43% uh, women have experienced sexual harassment in workplace, uh, um, even like official. official uh, and between uh, 5,000 5, and 12,000 12, girls and women are uh, trafficking every year and uh, that that's a big city that's a, a big so that's dominance. yeah dominant yeah dominance. yeah yeah how uh, uh, right how to address the developing country like uh, these situations uh, uh, in women case right uh, mm -hmm. even uh, after evening after seven or nine o'clock uh, seven or eight o'clock I have uh, each and everywhere uh, to Rixi uh, to uh, work alone uh, without uh, parents, uh, like uh, 90 to uh, 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 like young girls, uh, mm -hmm. how to address, how to minimize these situations. Wow. Uh, it's big, right? Mm -hmm. It's a uh, uh, different uh, developed country and developing countries, it's different uh, situations about this woman. How to address about this matter? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when probably, uh, Hannah, when you were talking about as long as there is dominance yeah. of one sex over another, we will never reach that, you know, uh, harmony with nature. That's it. You know, so that's a challenge, I think. That is yeah. a challenge. And I do think that part of the challenge is to recognize where there is that kind of suffering of women in the world. And the, the men, the, the, the powerful white men in, in the West who have more power now, um, I think it's important to express solidarity with those women and to, to light the candle and to be present to that plight and I think that, and as, as I know that that's really just the tip of the iceberg, but we need a moral conscience around that plight. That is part of solidarity with the rest of creation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, Bobby, sir, last time you uh, asked uh, what about your background, uh, like uh, religions, right? Uh -huh, yeah, uh -huh. but uh, yeah. Actually, I'm not uh, strongly uh, follow any religions. I, I'm, I respect all of them. I have uh, different types of friends. Uh, uh, like I, um, sometimes I am uh, celebrate uh, uh, a Christian festival like uh, uh, Christmas. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, <laughs> yes, sometimes um, Buddhism, relig uh, Buddhism religions like uh, 
uh, yeah, born in uh, Gautam Buddha, yes. So many <laughs> people uh, believe uh, Buddhist philosophy. Uh, some, uh, yeah, I have some friends, uh, Hinduism. Uh, Hinduism also, <laughs> I'm celebrated. That's I'm not <laughs> strongly uh, any follow religions, uh, but I don't know uh, all of the uh, respect them. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's cool. Robert joined us. Hey, Robert. Hello, we got back from the meditation thing, so we thought we would see if you were still on. Yeah, so, Robert and Desiree, uh, Hannah, are doing a meditation class that is uh, in a, it's not a park, it's a green space behind the Methodist Church downtown. So they have just been participating in their own form of eco-feminist theology. Love it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Love it. Hi, guys. Yep. <laughs> so Hannah, um, since we've got a few new people on here, I think that aren't familiar with you and your relationship to Ecclesia, could you just do a quick uh, kind of biographical summary of yourself? Sure. I am, um, I am, I was, I just graduated from the University of Chicago Divinity School. I am serving a church in um, Spring, Texas, just a freckle on top of Houston, Texas. Oh, and wow. um, mm -hmm, yeah, well, actually, so right now I'm actually hiding out at my mom's house, so Elizabeth's nice. house so in oh, central wow. Illinois. Um, but, yeah, but I, um, I got into ministry wanting to reach out to the spiritual but not religious, and I thought the church had a lot to offer that demographic, but um, it also had a lot to learn from that demographic. And so my, um, so a lot of my work and my study has been around what, like, what is the conversation around God and how does that participate in modern America? Um, and so, so I guess that's that's that. I've, I've enjoyed being um, invited onto the theology team for Ecclesia. And so when I can, I like to, um, I like to offer my, my faith journey and my perspective and the way that I'm forming my own little lexicon around, the, around God's participation in my life. And, and that's been really fruitful. Well, you're only about an hour or an hour and a half from Corpus Christi, so you're welcome here anytime <laughs> after this pandemic is over. You have the best seafood and everything you want. That sounds What's that? And that makes the best Indian food. <laughs> nice. He's a phenomenal host, too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yum. Okay, so you have an invite. He's at Corpus Christi. He's at the a and campus down there. Yeah. Mm. His office is the whole, when you walk in, <laughs> whole back wall, Florida ceiling, all the way is glass looking out at the beach. Oh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so you could go to work and practice eco-feminist theology. Yeah, really. Exactly. You, you, that's a big topic here in, um, on Oceanside. So, these are all they say this region is very conscious of that you know? mm, cool awesome why do you think that region i think you know for one thing they see the fury of uh, you know the hurricanes and you know storms and lots of stuff like that and they're also paying a heavy price on disappearing uh sea life i mean um uh you know, seafood harvesting has, has been done kind of over what they should be doing. And now all of a sudden there's all shortages of everything, you know? Uh, so oyster farming and shrimp and fish and, you know. So now everybody, even the citizens have now gotten into uh, replenishing, um, you know, uh, seafood, not just to uh, for commercial purposes, but actually to have God's nature to its fullest. You know, let people enjoy. Uh, you know, uh, having the such kind of bounty around them. You know, so and um, 
so there's lots of churches gotten involved in themes of environment and ecology, uh, schools and colleges and elementary schools and everybody has, is now into that consciousness. Mm. You know? So. Wow. I, I was gonna ask you too, I uh, thought of this earlier, um, I was first introduced to the idea of a labyrinth as a prayer tool in 19, when did I meet Dave? 2003, probably. Um, so yeah, early 2000s. Um, I was wondering if, um, because before that it had always been in some pagan tradition or some story, you know, related to that. So I was wondering if that is also tied to ecofeminist theology in some way. I do think that, and I think ecofeminism will claim anything that involves embodiment. Um, and I think embodiment of prayer happens in song, it happens in dance, it happens in walking. Anytime that you're able to be reflective, that, that the motions that you're doing participates in the reflection, I feel like ecofeminism would claim that as, yeah, that's useful and yeah, that's part of this. So yeah. Is it more then uh, it's more of the practice than um, I guess the more of the practice uh, of engaging with nature. Uh, yes, and but also natural processes. So your body is a natural process. And so if, if stillness in a dark room or stillness in your backyard even, if that is, if that is a mode of connection for you, then that, that counts, that counts as this kind of embodied reflection. Cooking, baking, um, shopping, like all of these things, <clears throat> embodied reflection and recognizing your connection to that thing that you're, that you're doing, that's all, that's all part of this. So you weren't, uh, you were having your audio trouble when my dad said that he was <laughs> envious because it's been so long since he has been uh, around someone as uh, full of life and new and the expectant uh, in your ministry. And uh, mm -hmm. so I, I think you missed that, but I wanted uh, to make sure you heard that. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. It's really refreshing for all of us too. I mean, for yeah. some of us, this is just a new way of doing church. And for yeah. others, it's a supplement to our church traditions, our faith and, and everything else that we do. But um, I would just say, I think just in general for me, having you uh, be part of these conversations um, has just, it just, it not only has opened my eyes to some things that I've never even knew existed, mm. like this, <laughs> or this term, yeah. I probably it's knew right. it, but I didn't call it that. <laughs> right? yeah. Yeah. Um, but also just, you know, just your energy and your light. Uh, I just, I, my aunt passed away this week and she was one of the first elders, female elders in the church and um something she was very proud of mm. and she was i said she was light and salt because she was like so many people um just as christ is for all people but she really lived that and uh that's something that you exude that for me as well oh michelle thank you for saying that Thank you for saying that. It's a, it's, it's hard. And I keep thinking I'm going to have to diversify my career. They're like millennials aren't giving to churches right now. <laughs> That's my generation. But um, there is something just so fueling about the curiosity around what's possible. When you just start thinking of spirituality in terms of our connectedness and what that, you know, what, what gets to inform that. And, you know, aren't we, I mean, isn't this just the perfect time to start really addressing our inter our interconnectedness? Um, so it's it's so beautiful that there's even a that there is a forum for this sort of um, engagement, and I appreciate that everyone's at least a little curious. <laughs> well, I'm certainly curious, and and I hope others were too. I just 
Yeah. I mentioned it on our last conversation. Uh, we didn't we didn't dive into it. Obviously, you had a lot of other things to say, um, but I just thought it would it was worth circling back around and taking another look at it. And I will go and read the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Um, Rick gifted me um, the other Bible for Christmas a few years ago, and that has that in it. Oh, good. I recommend it. You know, there is a final image that I'd like to offer about, uh, I, you could say ecofeminism, but I also just think spirituality and, and uh, interconnectedness, and I think this goes back to what we've already talked about, about the plight of women. Um, you hear a lot about the uh, um, bad apples. You hear a lot about the bad apples. Um, and I think that, you know, when it comes the whole phrase, do you know what I mean by the bad apples? The bad apples uh, um, don't represent the whole. So the actions of the, of the bad apples aren't indicative of the behavior of the whole group. But the whole phrase goes, um, a couple of bad apples spoils the barrel. And so I think it's really easy to start thinking about how, right, like, you know, when you're, uh, we're, as eco-feminists, we're conscious about how to other other people um, and how you kind of make that division. Um, if there is a problem, if, if, if there is a problem presenting itself as bad apples in our world and in our communities, I think we have to stop pretending like we're not in the barrel. And I think that some of the language around ecofeminism in our conversations today can really lend themselves to stepping in the barrel with at risk of the at risk of becoming a bad apple, at risk of associating with with really the chaos or the or the the really heatedness of where the bad appleness is coming from. But I think that if we can hold on to our connections, you and me all of us, if you and I can hold on to our connections and if we can really trust each other to be there for one another, for when we step into that barrel or recognize we're in the barrel there too, I really think that there's a lot of good work that can be done from inside that barrel. So um, you'll probably hear, well, it's just a couple of bad apples, especially going into this very heated political season. Um, mm -hmm. But as we go on, maybe this is a good time to go, you know what, we're in that barrel. And, you know, we right. have, we we can do something about this. So I just thought that that was a useful image for this time and for all of us, if we're stepping into this, really just embracing that we are connected and that we are better together. Well, a new, a new hashtag for us to use, better together. Oh, I love that. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I recently just did something y'all might be curious to watch. It's on Netflix, but it's um, been advertised. Zac Efron hosts it, and it's called Down to Earth with Zac Efron. I watched about, I don't know, four or so episodes, and it really awakened me to how far away from the garden we have actually come. So it sort of saddened me, but it also awakened me to potential and how, how easily God actually set it up for us, for things to work in, in communion with each other um, so easily. If we just would look for that and, and, you know, if the whole world could move in that direction, it would just, it would be back to the garden. Um, but it, it does give you hope um, for people that are out there trying to find solutions to our ecological problems and such. Awesome. I highly recommend the show. Awesome. I just yeah. shared it in the chat in case someone wants to be reminded of that. And then um, I can put back up at the end those things that Tracy shared. And I think what you just said is kind of brings us back full circle to Tracy sharing about the racial equity workshop that's coming up for her and the work that um, she's done so far personally that she shared with us that we too can be a part of. We are all in the barrel together. And we tend to, I think I tend to definitely say, oh, well, I'm not that way. 
but it's amazing how I forget that I still have a voice for those who don't have a voice or don't have as loud a megaphone, perhaps. And yeah, we're all in the barrel together. And I thank God for people like Tracy, who is really intentional about that, passionate about it, and continues to push forward for herself, but also to inspire others. We're very lucky. Um, before we close, I'm, uh, Hannah, I'll ask you to give a closing prayer, but I had one other question. You mentioned the millennials and you were referring to them not giving as much to churches, but as you can see, we are predominantly an over 40 group. And um, we have a couple people that are randomly involved that are in their 20s, um, mm. but, you know, not regular. Mm. And um, we would encourage uh, you to share with us uh, later, you don't have to do it now, but just looking at ways that Ecclesia could in the nature of what we do and how we do it might be more attractive to millennials than mm -hmm. traditional church. So be thinking about that because we're open. This is the, you know, we talk about the circle because we want to meet in small group circles ultimately, but Zoom has just been a, a dream come true. And mm -hmm. then the Genesis circle, which is this right now, as we're building Ecclesia, this is the training ground. This is the, um, you know, this is the, this is what we're molding and shaping and evolving and looking to, to challenge ourselves, question why we do something, change how we do it. It is not Michelle's way. It is not someone else's one way. It is literally here in this opportunity to, take this idea and really mold it and shape it. And so anybody who has feedback or ideas on what we could or should be doing to be more relevant, mm -hmm. is welcome to please, you know, speak up and, and call me or call somebody in the group and share their thoughts on that because um, it is the Genesis group in that we're trying to use this time to get it right before we go and try to duplicate it. Mm -hmm. um, mm, love it. I would love to think more on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Does anybody else have anything else before we close? Um, we're running long. So unless you have specific prayer requests that you'd like to jump in and share, um, uh, let me know real quick if, if some, we have some specific needs that we need to pray about, but uh, we will continue to keep those in prayer that we've been um, praying for. Um, in the Zoom chat, Elaine also shared the information that she was just talking about, so you can click chat and grab that. Um, and uh, we're having our um, monthly board meeting is Wednesday. Anyone is welcome. It's the same Zoom. You can get on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern time and uh, weigh in, listen in, whatever. Uh, but it's kind of a board slash really these days, it's more of the developing conversation. So um, you're all welcome to join us for that if you're interested. All right, Hannah, if you would close us. Sure. <clears throat> Let us go to God in prayer. God, we pause to breathe in your spirit. God, we hear you and feel you all around us. We thank you for all of the images and the ways of embodiment that draw us closer to you. Be near us. Be near us in our conversations be near us in our solitude, be near us in our community. We pray that we may be ever present to you in all the ways that you show up. We pray that we may be ever present to the plight of others. God, help us to remember that we are all so connected because of your love. 
help us remember that we are all in the same barrel. It is in your name that is spoken through the mountains, through the seagulls, through the blades of grass, and through the dough that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.